We've got tips and recipes for healthy living. So for fun and inspiration, come and join us in the raw food world. Welcome everybody, this is Matt Monarch with the Raw Food World TV show and today is Sunday, September 11th. 13th. 13th. And uh, we are, we have another special guest, we're at Steve Pavlina's house again. We got Angela eating Corella tablets. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. <laughs> hey Steve, hey, thanks, for, thanks for coming on again. Sure. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about how you, you, you've been on a raw food diet for a good amount of time and you were doing some experiments with cooked food and I thought it'd be really good for our listeners to maybe get in on this. Okay, well, as, as I was eating um, you know, raw food for a long time, um, I, got to, I got concerned that would I, you know, would I lose my ability to eat cooked food? Would I start getting so pure <laughs> that if I had, say, some cooked potatoes that I'd get suddenly sick? Because that's what happened when I would eat raw for just like 30 days in a row and then I'd go back to cooked food. I always had to go through this cooked food coma period where I got really sick for a while before I could readapt to it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling, is it always going to be practical to get raw food? And uh, I wasn't sure. So I thought maybe I don't want to lose my ability to eat cooked food just yet. So I started experimenting with that. And I found that uh, I found somebody else who was in a similar situation to me where she'd eaten raw, 100% raw for many years, and then started reintegrating a little bit of cooked food. And she got to the point where she had food once or twice a week and it wouldn't make her sick wouldn't have a problem with it whereas I couldn't do that at that point so I I, uh, I learned from her of just you know gradually in integrating a little bit of cooked food I think she started with adding some protein powders in her green smoothies uh, that were you know that were cooked and uh, not the smoothie but the protein powder right and just gradually reintegrating some of that stuff so I used something similar just like starting with a small amount and found um, that I was able to do it and then I seemed to find a really good balance between, you know, eating raw but with a little bit of cooked that was sustainable. Right. But I'm just continuing to experiment with it. So it's, it's, uh, it's not clear what the best way to do this is yet for me, but I, I've definitely learned a lot in the past year of just doing a lot of trials and error. Cool. Um, what type of foods would you mess around with? Um, mostly cooked vegetables, like try some cooked potatoes. Sometimes I just wanted something heavier. Um, what effect did it have on you? Well, <laughs> that was sort of funny. I find that I definitely feel better when I eat 100% raw. No doubt about that. I always feel better. But when I eat cooked food, uh, before my juice feast, before I did a 30-day juice feast, which is sort of a detoxing ritual, um, I, I used to get just, I would just get terribly sick if I ate a little bit of cooked food. After the juice feast, though, if I eat a little bit of cooked food, it makes me feel drunk. It's like having, <laughs> it's like having a glass or two of wine, okay? And, you know, I don't drink alcohol or anything, but I remember what this it feels like to be drunk. So as soon as I have some cooked food and it starts to digest, I immediately feel a little foggy mentally. I start feeling loopy um, and, and I can't concentrate as well. And then um, after about two, three hours, the effect goes away. It's like alcohol wearing off. So I don't know why that is, but it doesn't make me feel sick at all. And then I feel fine right afterwards. So I find that I can have, you know, cooked food a few times a week if I want to. And it doesn't, it doesn't affect me as, as negatively. But I always know I'm not going to be as there mentally. Like I, I won't right. be sharp. Won't be able to concentrate as well. So predominantly now, are you kind of eating raw? Or? Yeah, I'm, I still I still love raw foods. I'm eating predominantly raw. For the next couple of weeks, I'll go back to eating 100% raw because I don't like to do cooked food too much. But I, I like the idea that I seem to be getting the benefits of the raw food diet right. and still be able to integrate a little bit of cooked food without it making me sick and without it bringing me down. Um, it's not causing me to gain weight anything like that. So I'm not having any of the adverse effects, except those very temporary effects of it just makes me a little loopy for a certain period of time. Right. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Um, since you're a self-help master, um, okay, there's been a lot of, I mean, in my past, definitely even when I've been on raw foods, there's been times where I just was overeating and I felt like I was stuck in this rut and I wasn't doing exercise and I was just wasn't living up to it. Like, I just knew I wasn't like, a number 10 everywhere I wanted to be all the way around and like is there anything you can like maybe help people for like they they want to eat better not even necessarily 100% raw but like they just feel stuck in a sense like emotionally they can't handle it they're just like mm -hmm. oh yeah definitely I mean that was the thing for me too it's like be, trying to make that transition to raw was very difficult for me, for me I was able to go vegetarian and vegan without too much difficulty but going raw was the tricky one and I, I realized and th this is common for all of us we all have this problem is that our 
when we try to make these transitions, usually our environment does not support it. Okay, we're, if, if you're in a family full of meat eaters and that's how everyone around you is and everybody's eating the standard American diet and you decide you're going to be the one that's going to eat healthier, without social support, you're really going to have a hard time doing that. So most people, when they, they, they get stuck in these ruts, they won't even make that kind of change because there's no, there's no social support to push them forwards. So what worked for me was to create a new social environment around myself. In other words, I went out and made a whole bunch of raw food friends and I started communicating with them. And I didn't know people who were into this locally much, so I just started going online and just connecting with everybody online. And then I met a raw food meetup group here in Vegas and you know that they would do these potlucks. So I started going to those too. And that made it a lot easier to go raw and stay raw because now my social environment is supporting that change. Now I'm surrounding myself with people who are eating healthier than me. And, wow. and, and that included meeting you and Angela, you know, yeah. hanging out together and just, you know, going to raw spirit fest, um, talking to raw foodists, just getting around that energy and just getting around those people and then communicating with them constantly because they're going to check in with you. Well, like, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, and for a while I also had a, I did a consultation with a raw food coach, Roger Heskey. Oh, cool. Uh, and, and so he helped me too. You know, we did an hour long conversation, had some email follow-ups too. So just having other raw foodists in my life to pull me up to their level. Right. Is what helped. Wow. And so you can really use that same idea for any type of change you want to do. Yeah. you got you got to surround yourself with the social environment that's going to support it. And at the same time, you have to really break, I mean wreck, the social environment that's not going to support it. You know, kill off some of those connections. Sure. So if you're in a, in a social environment that's just going to run contrary to what your dietary goals are, you're going to have a really hard time transitioning, a really hard time getting stuck. If you want to exercise... Uh, one of the best things I found is I used to exercise solo all the time, and it uh, I got bored with it after a while. So I started doing classes at the gym, and I found that, oh, when you go to class, now you've got the social support. And then other people are there, like the instructor will say, hey, what's, you know, are you coming back next time? And, you know, they check in with you. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. I started doing spinning classes at the gym, and I started doing this combination yoga, tai chi, pilates class. And I don't even like yoga that much. But I've been going to the class because, you know, I know the instructor's name and she's like, if I know if I don't go, this is you know, where have we been? <laughs> <laughs> so having that kind of social um, uh, social support and uh, is really, really helpful. So can that work for like trying to make more money and stuff? Like go, hang around people? Oh my gosh, absolutely. That's how I started doing it. It's like learning from people who are making, uh, you know, more money than you are. I remember... Uh, when I was running my computer games business, one of my goals is I wanted to get to making $50,000 a year. I thought that would be awesome. So I joined this group called the Association of Shareholder Professionals, and I found the people there who were making $50,000 a year or more. And so I started asking them questions and making friends with them. And I went to a conference, and I would talk to those people. I'd email them and put them into my social circle, just constantly interacting with them. And then the people who were um, making, say, $10,000 a year or less from selling software online, I just wouldn't have as much connection with them. Right. I tried not to take their advice, or I'd always take their advice with a grain of salt. If somebody who was making $50,000 a year or more gave me a piece of advice and it contradicted with somebody uh, giving me advice who was making a lot less money than them, I, I said, okay, this person's wrong, this person up here is right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I started doing that, even though you know, it was, might be counterintuitive. That made all the difference in the world, and within a few months, maybe six months, I was up to that level of $50,000 a year. Wow. And then you start thinking, okay, who's making $250,000 a year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> start talking to those people. It's really the same thing. And uh, the thing people don't realize is how different those people think at different levels of income. The way people think when they're making $250,000 a year, way different than people who are making $50,000 a year. They notice different things. Um, they look, they see money differently. Like some people, you know, if you ask somebody, is $10,000 a lot of money? Well, uh, for somebody making $50,000 a year, the answer is probably yes. For somebody making $250,000 a year, no, it's a small amount. Right. It's less than a month's income. It's not, not a big not a big amount. Right. Wow. When was the last time we were here? Like uh, a few months ago. I don't remember exactly when. <laughs> yeah. You on on your board. You said you wanted to make a hundred thousand a month. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. I Again? mean, it, I'm not there yet, but uh, I mean, like this workshop we're doing it brought in an extra fifty thousand dollars for that. Wow. So and then we're going to turn the workshop into DVDs. Uh, uh -huh. So selling the DVDs might even get us there. Right. But I've definitely seen some shifts in that direction. Right. So how would you, like, let's say, like, it seems like if we wanted to talk to people that made a million dollars and become friends with them, or mm -hmm. it seems kind of like, I don't know, it might be a difficult task. Like, do you have any advice on that? See, it's, that's just a mindset thing. Yeah. Because I used to think the same. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again.
the roof. Well, 